Hi, so in this video, I thought I would talk to you about protection techniques that uh, an anti-malware vendor, anti-malware technology, uh, might use to be able to detect malware on your system. Now, in this first video, um, I'm going to give you a super high-level overview of a few basic techniques. Uh, I'm not going to go into any detail on each one except maybe say a few sentences about them. Uh, and then I'll do subsequent videos where I dive into uh, specific techniques in a bit more detail so that uh, you get a better feel for for how these things work. So in this video, think of this as, a, as an overview, if anything. Um, so I'd say that the kind of main, uh, I would say maybe first layer of protection techniques, uh, and this is again focusing primarily on the endpoint, so it's first layer uh, protection techniques comprise, I would say, a handful of different categories. So um, the most common one that you typically hear about are anti-malware signatures. Uh, and signatures tend to be uh, either they tend to be uh, very specific, uh, maybe targeted, or they'll they'll be generic. So there's targeted signatures that are designed to get a specific threat, uh, and then you have generic signatures which are designed uh, perhaps to get an entire family of threats that uh, have a common set of properties among them. Uh, then aside from signatures, uh, the next level down you have heuristics, and heuristics are uh, designed to be a bit more general in nature, so they, they'll basically uh, not try to identify a specific piece of malware, but they're more uh, uh, more broad, uh, and they're looking for characteristics of, of malware. So they're not around identification but more of a specific family or a specific threat, but much more broad uh, in, in trying to identify maybe general classes of malware. And, and there is some, oftentimes you can ex express a signature as a heuristic and, and vice versa. So they're um, there is a relationship between signatures and heuristics, but generally speaking, heuristics are thought of as things that are more broad than anything else. And then finally, uh, you have behavior. And behavior is really about looking at the characteristics of an application on the system. So this might be uh, what runtime characteristics does that particular application display. So for example, is it doing something that is off? Like let's say, is it talking over IRC to a server in a remote location that you would never be talking to otherwise. And if an application is doing that, you know, unless you're a common user of IRC for things, it's likely that you've been infected with some type of a botnet. So uh, just seeing that type of behavior alone uh, would be enough to, uh, to, to go ahead and classify something as malware. Okay. And then aside from the kind of first layer protection, I also uh, would like to mention that you have kind of a supporting cast. And, and the supporting cast are maybe technologies that are not geared toward detection, but are merely there to help detection capabilities. Uh, so one example of, of something that might be a supporting cast from a detection standpoint is a whitelist. And uh, whitelisting is really around how do we identify things that are good versus, uh, versus bad. And you know, in particular, where a whitelist is useful is a whitelist can help offset or mitigate the risk of false positives from technologies like heuristics and behavior that are a bit more generic in nature. So for example, uh, it could be that you might be using a legitimate IRC client on your system that uh, you were supposed to be using, and maybe it's a corporate IRC client, and, and if you have a whitelist entry for that particular IRC client, we can ensure that that IRC client will never get flagged accidentally by a behavioral uh, a behavioral approach. And this actually happens quite commonly, uh, for example, with things like instant messaging clients. So an instant messaging client will typically do things like hook the keyboard API, record keystrokes, and things of that nature as part of its normal operations. And it turns out that a lot of malware does the same kinds of things. And so if you're not careful, you can inadvertently label a, an IRC client or, a, or an instant messaging client as malware, and, and that would be a bad thing. So uh, whitelist is there to kind of offset that risk. A uh, second technology that I think is worth mentioning in the context of supporting cast are what I like to call spectrum or reputation type approaches. And, and here I'm kind of going to be a bit more broad because uh, this is a relatively new approach. And, and I would say different vendors have different approaches for, for, for doing these sorts of things. And so I don't want to uh, label what one particular vendor is doing versus another. But really, the idea behind reputation and spectrum based approaches is to leverage data from the field. So for example, if you know that a file is on a thousand systems, that's a, an example of something that might be a spectrum type piece of information. 
Um, and, and knowing that a file is on a thousand systems, you might treat it differently compared to a file that's on one system. So for the most part, most malware tends to be micro distributed. So it may be just on a handful of systems. And if, if you see a file that's on many thousands of systems, it's either going to be legitimate or if it's malware, it's likely that it should have been captured by your signature. So in other words, you wouldn't be using a heuristic or a behavioral technology to capture a popular file. Uh, and, and so signatures work really well for popular files. Although you can have signatures trigger for non-popular files, but they're, they're the best thing to use for kind of all the standard well-known viruses. And then the final thing on the, on the list of the supporting cast would be uh, sandboxing technologies. And, and I always say it's final. I don't mean that this is all you might want to do, but uh, these are just kind of a handful of things that I think are worth mentioning because you hear about them very often. And by sandboxing here, I don't mean network-based sandboxing as, as some vendors do, and I'll talk about that perhaps in a future video. But here I mean just anything that will take a piece of malware, maybe even on the client itself, and keep that malware in a safe environment where it cannot uh, do anything, do any damage outside. And when I say malware, I mean, let's say something that you might think is malware, or you're not sure of its disposition. It comes on your system, you may want to put it in kind of a, a special state where it can't cause any damage until you've seen it run for a long enough time uh, to make a distinction about whether it's, it's good or bad. And, and these things kind of all go hand in hand. So you can often use, for example, uh, spectrum-based approaches to help offset the risk of false positives as well uh, from heuristics and behavior. And you can also use sandboxing to, to run things for a while. And, and while they're running, you can monitor their behavior and, and so on and so forth. So I hope this gives you a really quick, again, this is a 10,000 foot overview of the kinds of protection technologies you see in practice. And what I'll do in future videos is go into each of these areas in some more detail. Thanks a lot, and I will see you in the next video.